everyone. Um, I hope you're, you're all awake. I hope you got your coffee and your croissant because we're going to dive into a bit of a geeky topic, which is uh, graph combined to, to AI. Um, so as, as a quick intro, I'm Romain, and I work for, for this fund called Eurasio. We are one of the most active investors in tech in Europe, and notably in AI. Uh, we've invested in companies like uh, Neo4j, obviously, but also Mistral, DataIQ, Cognigy. Um, and back in 2020, um, I met this founder, Emil, um, a, a Swedish engineer who had uh, a vision that you could um, uh, have much more impact on your data if you were to store it as a graph rather than rows and columns. This sounded a bit crazy to me, but I, I, I dug into the topic and I realized that actually for any use case that requires big data sets and complex uh, interrelation between data, so a lot of the AI use case today, uh, the graph technology would be relevant. Um, and um, it became core to our investment thesis that with the rise of AI, graph would become a must. And actually at the time, I had even added uh, in our uh, investment uh, memo um, a quote from uh, um, Bob Mumlia, the, the CEO of um, Snowflake. He was stating that uh, by 2030, uh, most of predictive analytics, which was the AI of the time, uh, would be done uh, via graph. Um, and so, fast forward to today, we, we're halfway through that journey. We've invested into Neo4j, happily so, and um, I couldn't be more excited to have this discussion uh, with uh, Philippe. He's the CTO uh, of Neo4j. He's one of the key uh, brain and architect behind uh, Neo4j technology. Um, so, Philippe, it's been 13 years that uh, you've joined uh, Neo4j. Uh, what was your thesis? at the time, and how has it evolved since? Yeah, that's an uh, uncommon period of time for a Silicon Valley person, right? Um, so the, I, I, I guess what's proving uh, different and new in this thesis is the emergence of Gen AI, which I didn't predict LLMs occurring the way they did, but seeing that actually the product that we'd built accidentally solves many of the top problems that uh, Gen AI builders face, uh, namely hallucinations, getting better answers, explainability, and then governance. Um, and it turns out that having a knowledge graph and a graph database to store your connected system gives you a good basis for knowledge, memory, and a bridge between human and machine understanding and human and machine action. If I rewind, though, like why is this? My original thesis was uh, sort of born out of coming out of many years of working as a database practitioner uh, data practitioner in the data space, having worked with almost every relational database on the planet. Um, and seen in the early 2010s, there was a lot of really interesting motion in the database space, both on the analytic side with Hadoop and on the transactional side with the likes of you know, MongoDB and Redis and you know, Couchbase and all those other companies. The thing that, they, that was missing that Neo4j solved for is the connections in the data. All those other technologies that I named uh, bring, to, bring data together so that you can do simple like store and retrieve transactions at scale or simple basic analytics at scale, which was an important problem back then, don't get me wrong. But actually my experience in data showed that what's most valuable in the data is the patterns in the data, the relationships in the data. In fact, we know from a lot of research, including sociology, that if you want to predict the behavior of an individual or a person in a network, you can get better predictive power by understanding how the people around them behave and how the people around those people behave and how the people around those people behave. So the world is built up of, you know, we're butter, like a sum total of butterfly effects and context and causality come out of understanding relationships. So the you know, kind of the big vision here was let's build a database management system from scratch for to rep in a way that represents the way the real world tends to show up, which is either as a network, network of people, ideas, biology, ecology, payments, telecommunications, and so on, as hierarchies, hierarchies of people, bill of materials, asset ownership, permissions, so on, uh, or as paths and journeys. All the, the best general representation for all those is a graph. And so we were inspired actually by the human brain which stores data as you know, 
neurons, axons, and nodes relationships, and then processes by traversing those, and said, you know, let's uh, we'll, we'll be solving an important um, important gap here in the data space. Thank you, Philippe. So um, I wanted to start by addressing, uh, you know, a question that you know keeps coming up during this conference. There was a panel on it yesterday, and 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 I keep you know hearing the topic uh, on uh, when I'm talking to to people here is, uh, you know, it's been two and a half years since since ChatGPT and Gen AI, and since still you know like there is not so many um, use case um, in production in the enterprise world. Um, so how does it come that, you know, can you can you lay out for us the reason why it's taking so much time and why uh, the enterprise world is not at its uh, full potential uh, today on, on AI? When a new technology emerges, it's natural to, you know, take the pendulum swing and try solving every single problem with just that technology. And that's what's happened. Like the, the normal process is, I'm going to build a Gen AI application, so I'm going to use an LLM. How far can I get with an LLM? Well, if I can solve my problem with just one tool, just one model, that's easier. And invariably, what's happened is we've learned over the last few years that models in themselves can only solve for certain things. And there are other things that they can't solve for where you need other tools. And this is where you, know, you, you see a journey from big model to multiple models to fine tuning to, okay, that's not enough. I'm going to bring in maybe some vector based rag. That's not enough. Why? Because you're missing explainability. You're missing, you're still in the realm of probabilities and non deterministic answers. And there's no ability to actually apply security and access controls um, and privacy access controls to the underlying data. In other words, you don't want to train your model with PII or with regulated data because the model has no ability to discern who should be able to see what or what, it, what data it even uses in answering a question. Um, so it's just been the natural evolution starting with, let's just start with the one tool and then build up and see what works. And what many people are starting to bump into is um, you know, that this the low success rate, 70%, give or take of Gen AI applications lead to very promising prototypes, but can't check all the boxes to get to production. It, when you add a knowledge graph, you can check those boxes much better. There's a Gartner report from just a month ago that states that there's an 80% improved chance of making it to production with a Gen AI application um, if you include knowledge graphs and do graph rag. Super interesting. But so what you're telling us is I cannot just throw uh, the best and latest LLM to my data. It's not going to be enough to be successful in uh, in building apps. Um, and, and you're, you know, touching on on what Neo4j can do. But maybe it would be helpful to the audience if you could give like a very concrete uh, in production use case, a business critical, like something you know uh, that really works. Like, do you have such example? Sure, I have lots. Uh, in fact, Neo4j is in 84 of the Fortune 100. Uh, I go to the Valley and attend you know, startup events, and half the founders, it seems, that I talk to are doing something with graphs, realizing that's the next step. But let, let me actually, let me pick one example, which many people in the room will have heard of. Klarna, the Swedish payments company, was in the news cycle a few times over the last year as the poster child for I believe the most advanced, uh, successful AI implementation in the enterprise. Um, they started with a vision of being, uh, you know, very Gen AI, very AI first culturally, and so they started going through this journey I described earlier than most. Um, the secret that the CEO, uh, well, so, so what they actually did was built an internal chatbot that has access to all the company's knowledge. And as a result, they were able to unplug 1,200 SaaS applications, including Salesforce and Workday and so on. So how did they do that? Uh, the, the CEO spent about six months not wanting to tell anyone because he considered the way they built it to be a secret sauce and to provide competitive differentiation. And then finally, he let the cat out of the bag and uh, reveal that it's actually cursor on top of a Neo4j based knowledge graph. So why 
and what do they get out of it? Um, what his observation was, if I, as a CEO, look at a macro level across my company, I want an AI that can make decisions that take into account all of the company's knowledge, everything the company knows, subject to privacy, access controls, et cetera, because those are the company's assets. Those are the data that fuel for AI, of course. Um, but if you have your data in different silos and it's not connected, then you can't use uh, all of the company's knowledge to make any given decision. You're going to just use the data in the HR departments or in this application or in that application. So they connected their data up into a knowledge graph, which is an ideal structure for making these connections. It's you know, kind of the network of the company's own data. Um, and that became a basis for, again, better, you know, making this application useful enough, accurate enough, secure enough that it could solve this problem. So I, I meet with multiple companies per week that are going through the same journey and you know, lots of use cases across all domains. And it's uh, becoming a secular trend in enterprise AI. When you say accurate enough and like, how do you measure success in such an application? Like, uh, what is the uh, ROI of using Neo4j versus another approach? I mean, ultimately the big one is, can it make it to production or not, right? But then the, so helping to get a, an application to production, whatever it is, I would say is probably the biggest indicator of value. Okay, now the question is, well, what does that application do? Is it useful to begin with? Um, and things that I've seen, even, you know, you invested with an AI thesis before Gen AI, so this has been an AI technology for, for some time. If you can understand the way the system behaves uh, and predict individual behaviors based on connections in that system and bring your context together, then uh, you, you, you oftentimes unlock a whole set of possibilities that just didn't previously exist. And when people try solving those with other technologies, um, lots of examples of you know the largest Oracle database, an entire company that someone tried to do too much with, you know it's a great technology but not so great when you start chasing down connections. That they were able to do the processing a thousand times faster with one tenth the hardware. Well, if I can do something a thousand times faster, that's not an efficiency that unlocks completely new possibility. So, uh, Philip, uh, you're, you're telling me that uh, Neo4j and an LLM can replace Salesforce and, and many SaaS. I'm a tech investor, so are you just telling me I should write off half of my portfolio? Hmm, how do I, how do I break this to you? Um, so, uh, y yes and no. So, as far as a SaaS application is just a CRUD layer, create, read, update, delete, on top of a database, then that can be really easily built, right? LLMs can help generate queries. They can generate UIs and applications. So I'd be pretty worried for those. So hopefully, you know, being AI savvy, you invested in companies that do more and have their own network effects with their own users, their own data network effects, perhaps with uh, data that they use, that they combine with the customer's own data that's value add, um, particular domain expertise. So. I think for you know, people doing SaaS, those, that's going to be the differentiation going forward. Um, and then for builders, like, should you, should you go out and replace Salesforce? You know, you'll get some level of economy out of that if, if it's an ROI case. But um, there's much more top line benefit to be gained than bottom line. So I'd say, you know, replace your simple applications as a way to experiment and learn and build a culture and tooling around AI. But you know the really the value comes in with the new things that you can do. But, you know, if it's so powerful, um, why is it uh, the case that it's not more spread across? I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm hearing startup companies like you uh, starting to use Neo4j, uh, but, you know, um, if it's so, so powerful, like, it should be a must to, for any AI builder. It's getting there, and the... You know, I, I, this is just where we are in the cycle. It takes a while for people to, you know, get their heads around even LMs and how do we govern them and which ones can we use and to contract them and then go through this journey of realizing that that's not enough. I think the advantage that folks in this room and others have is enough other companies have gone through the same journey that you can pattern match and say, look, if my data, um, A, if... I need more than just data in one silo. I want to connect it. 
And you know, uh, technologies like Databricks and Snowflake are great for bringing all of your data into one place, but they don't connect them. Like Snowflake literally doesn't have primary and foreign keys. So if I need to connect my data and or if my data is inherently connected, like I want a digital twin of some part of the real or digital world that is inherently a network, some kind of path or a hierarchy, then uh, you have the advantage now of being able to anticipate the need for a graph and just bring it in from the beginning rather than bumping your head against the wall multiple times. Okay, uh, but you know, still, I think you know, as an investor, what I see is that this infrastructure piece uh, is is moving every six months. It's it's rag, then it's you know uh, fine tuning, then then it's like agentic, like uh, investing in a technology like Neo4j takes effort and time from the developers, so it's also a commitment. What can you tell to the AI builder out there, like to um, convince them that you know if you invest in Neo4j technologies for the long run? Yeah, let me answer this in a couple ways. So one is from a data perspective, your data is a core asset. And an advantage with graphs is you have flexibility in the schema. You don't need to design like containers into which to put the data, namely tables and a whole model, and then realize tomorrow or next week and the week after you keep needing to add new data to solve new business problems, which by the way is the way this all this works, right? It's very iterative. So it's an agile iterative approach that lets you start small, build out, and get data network effects, as well as something I've experienced, use case network effects, which is once you get the data together to solve a certain problem, like recommendations, you can also, with the same data, solve other problems, like fraud detection and supply chain optimization and so on. The other way I'll answer the question is, you, you, know, you want to use technologies that you can depend on, and a big investment that's been made in the graph space is um, in standards and in open source. And standards are, you know, kind of the CIO's best friend when it comes to interoperability, tooling, skills reuse, also best friend of the developer, you know, not having to figure out, you know, some, learn some new language whenever you go to a different company or use case. And uh, less known fact outside of the database uh, standards world ISO last year, after a five-year effort, just created the second ever standard for databases. Uh, so you have SQL, but now you have a companion, sibling, successor language to SQL called GQL, which enshrines the property graph model, which is what we're talking about here, and the query language on top of it, which more or less is this language called Cypher, which Neo4j open sourced in 2015. So you can have confidence, actually, this is one, one of the few parts in the AI stack where there literally is an international standard that's been hashed out and that models can actually speak. So you, know, you can have models make your job easier in constructing and querying graphs because they've been trained on this query language through a decade plus of examples and code on GitHub and so on. Okay, so maybe to conclude, can we say that um, uh, being successful in building a Gen AI app is like building, being successful in uh, doing a mayonnaise? Mayonnaise. Mayonnaise. Attends, mais c'est yeah. trop français, ça. Qu'est-ce que tu veux me dire? Okay, just, just one, one final word on that. So, you final know, word, make, yes. make, we're it, wrapping up now. Yeah, it, it's hard to create. Like, mayonnaise is very simple ingredient. It's egg, oil, mustard. Uh, being a Gen AI app is LLM, data, cluster. But if you just throw them together, you get, you get a mess. You need the emulsifier. And, you know, can Neo be this emulsifier? And what would be your advice for people building? Yeah, in ingredient, the one ingredient that helps complete your solution, get you to production, I definitely buy that. So lots of resources out there for learning. Uh, look up GraphRag Manifesto, graphrag.com, et cetera, et cetera. Um, thank you. Thanks, everyone. With French people, it always